Hello? Now we can hear you. You can hear me now? I'm sorry about that. Um, I think I had a technical issue. Um, so let me just go over the quick references real quick. Um, sorry about that, everyone. I had a technical issue on my end, uh, which is ironic because I was the one hosting the WebEx call today to help you with any technical issues that you have. Um, so welcome to our call um, and happy Wednesday. And so before we get started, I'm just going to quickly go over the um, WebEx quick references. Um, so if you want to tap, chat into um, the chat, be sure to click the All Participants drop-down menu that's on the right-hand side of the screen and type in any comment or question that you may have so everybody can hear, um, see it. And if you have any technical questions specifically, um, click the same drop-down menu and click Host and I'll be able to directly help you, help you out. Um, and so entered this answer into your answer into the chat box um, but earlier I had asked how did you learn about this call but just so we can move forward with the call um, you can type your answer um, but we won't have um, too much time to go over everybody's answer right now um, and thank you again to everyone who um, went over the map and clicked on where they were calling from it looks like we have a great group with us today I'm located here in Boston Massachusetts um, we have our, um, a few folks um, in Texas, California, um, Washington State, Patty and Kate um, from the TCP team is in the DMV area. Um, and so it looks like we have a great group of people joining us here today. And I'm going to pass it to Patty and she can get us started. And sorry again for the technical issues, um, but we have a great call ahead of us today. And if you have any technical issues of your own, please feel free to tap, um, chat, type into the chat box and message the host directly with me. Patty, I'm going to pass you the ball in just one second. You sound a little distant, Patty. Okay, is this better? I'm a little better. Okay, I think we're getting some feedback. Uh, if we can just have everyone mute their line. Um, if this is okay, let me know. Yeah, I think that's better. Um, hi, this is Patty Webster. Um, I'm wondering if we're still having some phone issues. Um, Jason, I see you it need to be like loud. Is this better? You're somehow logged in twice, so I don't know if you can. Uh, uh, thank you. It's Kate. like you're kind of double echoing yourself here. All right, hold on one second. I apologize. And then just another note to the other presenters or panelists to try to mute your lines because we're getting a little bit of background noise. Sorry, folks, for the technical difficulty. I'm going to try, try again. Can you hear me? Can you do it again? Can you can y'all hear me now? Way better. All right. Uh, well, this is the this is the call of technology glitches, and I appreciate everybody um, being patient with this. Welcome, as Naomi said, to our uh, National Healthcare Decision Day call. Um, this is Patty Webster. I am calling from Arlington, Virginia, where there's snow, so I, I'm going to blame the snow on this. Um, so I'm just going to run real quickly because we've got a really packed agenda. I'm going to run through a little bit of an agenda um, of our call. Um, I want to welcome those that are on. We've got organizations who are looking for ideas on how to plan or organize events around NHDD. Um, this is geared towards those who are planning events. And also we have a lot of individuals that have called in seeking more information on how you can personally get involved in National Healthcare Decisions Day. So we're just really thrilled to have you all here. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to run through, and Naomi, maybe you can pass me the ball when you get a chance. Um, um, we're going to uh, in introduce Nathan Kopkamp, um, who we're super excited to have here with us today, and he's going to share a little bit about the history of National Healthcare Decision Day. 
Um, and then we are going to welcome three groups um, who are representing work from three different areas of the country um, that we hope will spark some ideas and help you think through what you can do to plan activity um, within your own communities and also how you might get involved personally. Um, so we're really excited to have these three groups and I'm going to introduce them as we um, get to their portion of the call. Um, and then what we're going to do is I really want to make sure that we have time um, for your questions and feedback at the end. So um, we're going to run a tight ship here, but we want to hear what you might be planning for NHED. And I see uh, a lot of folks are participating in the chat, which is great. Um, I encourage you to continue uh, participating in that chat, put in what you're planning on doing. If you're new to NHED, go ahead and chat that in if you have that ability. Um, for those on the line that aren't on the computer, uh, we hope to get your feedback in other ways. Um, but we will um, loop, loop at the end of the conversation about uh, what folks can do um, moving forward. Um, so a quick intro to Nathan. Um, I just want to back up a teeny bit. For those that might be new to the Conversation Project, I just want to um, give a little bit of background on who we are. Um, we are a patient engagement campaign that is dedicated to really assuring that everyone's wishes for end-of-life care are expressed and respected. Um, and we are really keen on ensuring that those wishes and conversations um, happen before a healthcare episode um, happens. And so those conversations are happening early and often uh, within the comfort of your homes, within your community. Um, and then those wishes are respected when the time comes. Um, and uh, it is a combination of, of events there. Um, we are super excited to have National Healthcare Decisions Day um, to really highlight the importance of our work, but also we, we like to say, um, I know Kate has said this in the past, uh, our fearless leader, that this is a national holiday that we really like to rally around. And I see by the sheer number of participants on the call that you are here uh, to learn and rally around us too. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass us over to Nathan um, and have him share a bit about a National Healthcare Decisions Day. So Nathan Kotkamp, I'm gonna pass the ball down. Um, and I'd like you to go ahead and take it away. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Just confirm that you yeah, can hear this me. Yeah, is, this is perfect. It's perfect. All right. So um, I don't know if it was mentioned, but I am your humble leader, if, if you will. Um, I am the founder and chair of National Healthcare Decisions Day. Uh, during my day job, I'm an attorney with McGuire Woods uh, in Richmond, Virginia, where I practice healthcare law. Um, but the, the way in which I came about this whole thing is I serve on several hospital ethics committees, and I just kept on seeing a perpetual issue with end-of-life care and um, essentially hospitals just not doing what they are obligated to do. And I got sick and tired of seeing it as a problem, and I started out um, doing something within my own state back in 2006. Uh, yeah, because it was 2006. Um, we started with uh, National, sorry, Virginia Advanced Directives Day, uh, and after two incredibly successful years of that, um, we sort of had a choice uh, whether we were trying to expand and saturate more of Virginia, or whether we would take the, the model that we had uh, and go nationwide, and we chose the latter. Um, and it's, every time I think about it, it, it astonishes me. Um, where we've come in um, coming up on our, our 12th year as a national event. So let me just talk a little bit about where we, uh, where we came from and where we are going um, and some of the things that we've done along the way. And just so you know, I've only got five minutes here, so I'm really hitting this at a high level. Um, but for those of you who don't already know, April 16 is National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, it is a bit of a national holiday at this point, de, de facto. Uh, it's also been recognized by uh, both houses of the Congress, so I guess it is formally a, a national holiday as well. Um, it is intentionally April 16th, the day after tax day, because our uh, wonderful leader, um, Benjamin Franklin, uh, reminded us that nothing in life is certain but death and taxes. And that um, that sort of quip and, and the ability to use a little bit of humor uh, sometimes is a way that, that people have found sort of a hook to getting people's attention, because talking about death and dying and disability and, and frailty and all the other things that, that are so um, caught up in the topic of advanced care planning um, make it very difficult for a lot of Americans in particular and other cultures too, but, but we're here in uh, the United States. Having that be a little bit of humor can sometimes break the ice and, and get things done. 
So uh, as I mentioned, I founded this after lots of years of experience on ethics committees and just seeing so many ways in which we could do things better. Um, and in a nutshell, what we've got here in the, in the third bullet point is that all across the country, healthcare facilities, healthcare professionals, chaplains, legal community, and others, um, including banks and libraries and social groups and um, you name it, book clubs, are participating in a collective effort to highlight the importance of making advanced healthcare decisions and to provide tools uh, for making those decisions. And you notice that it's National Healthcare Decisions Day. It's not Virginia Advanced Directives Day. It's not National Advanced Directives Day. It is about the process. And although we only have one day to celebrate, um, this should be a year-long effort. This should be something that uh, if we do what we are doing correctly, um, at some point it's gonna be so integrated in the healthcare delivery system um, that there is no question about it. It's just it's a routine part of, of um, annual physicals. It's something that is discussed by your doctors and your nurses when you come in for something as simple as uh, a kidney stone, which happened to me when I went to the ER the other day. Um, they didn't know if I was dying or if I had a kidney stone, but yet I wasn't asked about my advanced directive and that was frustrating. So um, just daily reminders in what I do uh, of the need for what we are doing. Um, we have a website, nhdd.org has a whole host of information. It's all there, it's all free. Participation in National Healthcare Decisions Day is free. Um, we, are, we operate on a shoestring budget. We are immensely grateful for uh, the Conversation Project for sort of being our host, if you will. Um, but if you're inclined to, to make a charitable donation, we'll certainly take that and we promise to use it well. But National Healthcare Decisions Day is really a coalition. It is not, we're not a 501c3, we're not formally organized. Um, it is all about people who care doing what they can do best. So this is a, admittedly an old slide. These are the results from our 10 year anniversary of National Healthcare Decisions Day. And part of the reason I don't have an update to this is we changed the methodology which, uh, which resulted in these numbers. So all I can tell you is the numbers have blossomed even further from here. But suffice it to say that in 10 years we've had uh, at least 110 national organizations and these are big, big players in, in the healthcare and the legal world, uh, American Hospital Association, Nurses Association, AARP, NHPCO, other things like that. Um, and at least, and again I say at least because we are perpetually finding participation in National Healthcare Decisions Day that we don't even have registered participants um, in our database for. So we know that there's something to the tune of 16,000, I mean 1,600 state or national organizations or coalitions or organizations or institutions that are doing something for National Healthcare Decisions Day. We've had participation in U.S. military bases throughout the world, um, including in combat Iraq where they were doing things because of all the people who might need a, an advanced directive, um, an advanced care plan, Lord knows it's our, our uh, military uh, out there. So those are some just hugely rewarding um, numbers. We've had within organizations, whether it's emails, newsletters, um, conference calls, webinars, over 4.7 million members of those organizations receiving some sort of information about National Healthcare Decisions Day or training about advanced directives, is something of that sort. Again, we've sort of loosely um, pulled what kind of community participation we've got, but the numbers are huge. Um, within the, the, the general public, 3.9 million members of the general public have come to seminars, webinars, um, town hall meetings, visited somebody sitting there at a mall in the middle of, you know, the middle of the country. Um, and those are only estimates because a lot of the organizations don't even respond to the survey, but we know that there's activity going on. Um, on social media, we've had a huge impact too. Of that we can measure, over 15 million people have been exposed to National Healthcare Decisions Day on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, we even got uh, the hashtag NHDD to trend on Twitter in 2015. And if you understand what trending is all about, you know that as a big, big deal. That's a big accomplishment to get it to trend. Um, and then, although it's not about documents specifically, it is kind of cool to know that over 37,000 advanced directives have been completed in the 10 National Healthcare Decisions Days alone. So 
this is about solutions. It all started with it, with a solution to a problem, which is lack of advanced care planning, uh, providers not knowing where advanced care plans were when people had actually uh, sort of beat the odds, only about 25% of, of the adult population has one, and providers don't know where to look, they don't know how to ask, they don't know how to engage. So some of the solutions, and there are lots of solutions on the website, there's lots and lots of ways in which you can approach National Healthcare Decisions Day. But first and foremost, first of all, I'm thrilled that we've got over 100 attendees on this call, and I know there's sort of a range of folks from a range of places doing a range of different things. But lead by example. You gotta have your own advanced directive. You have to do the process yourself in order for you to be effective at helping others. Um, one of the things we say about advanced care planning is it's a benefit to your loved ones, it's a benefit to you. But in order to help others, in order to be a real champion, you have to go through the process, which is not to say that you would come up with the same decisions as I or anybody else. We don't care, frankly. Uh, NHDD is not prescriptive about what your choices have to be. It's the process itself that makes you a better advocate for other people going through the process. Talk with others. When you've done it, go back to the lead by example. Get yourself on social media. Um, tell your friends and your family. Don't, you don't have to share what your choice is, except for the, you know, within that tight um, group of loved ones who may be your advocates if you ever have a health crisis. But challenge those in your life to go ahead and engage in advanced care planning themselves. Volunteer to speak. Get out in the community. Collaborate within the community. This is a great opportunity. Um, there should be no shame in trying to advertise and put your name out there. Um, through NHDD activities, that is a win-win for everybody. So get out there and, and do things, put, you know, hospitals and nursing homes together and law firms and um, social groups, that, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, be creative and go out there and do stuff because we all are touched by healthcare crises in one way or another and share the resources. Everything that is there um, is, is for free on the National Healthcare Decisions Day website. Um, I also like to remind people that NHDD is about you professionally. Anyone who is in the healthcare field, this is something that's required by federal law, but it also results in just simply better care. It's about you personally. None of us have any idea what's gonna happen when we get off this call. Some of us may have car accidents on the way home. Some of us are gonna have a heart attack or a stroke or whatever. We are all potential patients throughout the day. So why not plan for it? Um, have a plan for if you have a healthcare crisis. It is National Healthcare Decisions Day on April 16, but these, this issue and the topic is, is relevant any time of the year. So don't feel limited in any way to April 16. Um, we'll take anything you can do. The free resources are there um, year-round at nhd.org. And the other thing I just want to mention, I uh, hopefully you are all uh, on this call getting the monthly emails on the 16th of every month without fail, we send out uh, a, a, an email that talks about some of the things that are going on, provides some tips, um, and a lot of it is sort of like me doing like a blog. Um, and most recently in January, I encouraged the initiative to move beyond just uh, end of life issues, which are obviously hugely important, but also to consider other ways in which advanced care planning uh, can be done. So psychiatric advanced directives, advanced directives for people that have, um, you know, strongly held beliefs about blood transfusions or amputation or other things like that. We should not feel limited, and this is not just about end of life issues. So it is National Healthcare Decisions Day. Any kind of decision is welcome here. Um, so if you can help me sort of expand the focus beyond just uh, end of life care um, without giving that up, obviously, um, that would be sort of my wish list of where we go with this initiative next. Um, finally, well, sorry, I went too, too fast. That's me, um, and that's how you contact me. Those are my contact, that's my contact information. Um, and uh, please feel free to reach out. If there's anything I can do to help NHDD participants, um, I think the folks on the, the call can attest that I am um, always thrilled to do it um, for what it's worth. And because I saw some folks from Bellingham, Washington um, listed in the attendees list, I'm actually gonna be celebrating National Healthcare Decisions Day in Bellingham. It's one of the 
sort of little hot spots of, of NHCD, and uh, I promise to go out there, and I'm looking really forward to that. So um, thanks for th to that little hot spot, and thank you for all that you're doing. Look forward to hearing what some of the, uh, the participants have been doing, and I'll be around for questions at the end. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. And I just want to just emphasize um, our gratitude and thanks for your amazing leadership. Um, and just it's a testament on what uh, an idea and experience can spark. Um, you said it's it blossomed. It is totally snowballed, um, and it's a phenomenal movement. So, so thank you so much. Um, if you pass well, me you. the ball, sure. If you pass me the ball, I'm going to um, help Tracy advance the slides, and I'm going to I'm going to jump right into this and introduce um, our first speaker. Um, Nathan mentioned that this is not just about the day, but it's about the process. Um, so we have a fabulous, um, our first speaker is a fabulous speaker uh, who's going to share a little bit about the process at Haven Hospital Hospice in Edison, New Jersey. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Tracy Grafton. She is a social worker and bereavement coordinator. Um, Haven Hospice is part of Hackensack Meridian Health, um, which is um, uh, doing some phenomenal work, um, both at the community level and at the hospital level. Tracy's worked in hospice and palliative care for over 20 years, um, has done some teaching at a couple of the universities in New Jersey. Um, and in addition to serving the needs of dying and bereaved, she's worked really um, passionately and ardently for the past three years to help raise awareness about advanced care planning, both within the system, but also really critically in the community um, that the system serves. So I'm going to... Um, Nathan or Naomi, can you pass the ball to me so I can help advance the slides? I just need to take this ball over here and drag it up to my name. We can do that. And um, so, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, Tracy, uh, we're going to pass it over to you to share a little bit of your lessons, and, I, and I'm going to give you a little bit of warning. We've got 10 minutes for each of the presentations. I know it's going to be tight, um, but I know we can do it. So, Tracy, go ahead. I'll do my, <clears throat> Patty, I'll do my best. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your help with uh, advancing the slides. I have some mouse issues. So uh, great teamwork from the Conversation Project and NHDD. Um, <clears throat> I have to say I'm really excited about this national holiday. Honestly, I get more excited about it than I do Christmas. Um, I hope that there's something that I share in the next few slides that is helpful to people out there. And um, like Nathan, I just wanted to share that my motivator is you know, 19 years of working in hospice and end-of-life care and the frustration that you begin to feel, um, and just not wanting to swim in frustration, uh, but really to take some action. And um, that's kind of what got me started a few years ago in getting more involved in healthcare decisions then. I was happy to find the resources out there nationally. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about where we are. Um, so the first slide shows you the red box is the county that we're in in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey is not the largest state, but it is very densely populated. And I guess uh, the takeaway from this slide is I just wanted you to know that um, for in 2018, our hospital, which is called JFK Hospital, celebrated its 50th anniversary as a community hospital. And in keeping with the nationwide trend, oops, um, hold on one second, sorry. JFK um, merged last year with a large healthcare system, Hackensack Meridian Health, and it now comprises 16 acute care hospitals. So we went from one to 16, and we have 450 outpatient facilities. We're now the largest, most comprehensive, not-for-profit healthcare system in New Jersey. Um, our diversity is one of our greatest strengths but it is also one of our biggest challenges when it comes to advanced care planning. Okay, next slide, Patty. Thank you. Um, so what this uh, slide does is illustrate, if we look at the bottom to the top, let's go to the bottom on the left-hand side, 2008 to 2014. I just wanted to give you an idea of our audience and what, what we were doing back then. So for six years, we put a table in the lobby and we just, through, you know, papers that people, as they came through the hospital lobby, um, not much focus on conversation, very much a focus on forms and document completion. And then <clears throat> I think because of my uh, knowledge that I've gained through the help of the conversation project and an HDD, it really, I started to understand that it needed to be more than that. 
And so over the last few years, as you can see from 2015 to 2017, we did a lot of programming, um, a lot of diverse programming um, aimed at various populations. And obviously, I'll, I'll let you go through this, this slide on your own, but I wanted to point out to you that in 2018, the year of the merge, which I have in red, um, that really was a challenging year for us to go from one health hospital to a 16 acute care hospital system. Um, we're still, and it's gonna be probably for many years, uh, sifting through the layers of that merge. And uh, I was instructed that year to really just kind of hold tight. You know, change is not something that comes easy to, in human nature. And um, I was basically, you know, told to hold back, find out what headquarters does, and, um, you know, keep everything close to the vest. Um, so I thought that was a sort of a sad downturn, um, but I'm happy to report that we've recovered and we're beginning to look to the future again. And in 2019 this year, um, we're gonna be hosting uh, an event on April 18th, which is um, gonna be a statewide uh, coalition uh, summit, and I'm really excited about it because it's not just our healthcare system. The coalition consists of 13 um, organizations, uh, bodies, you know, statewide level. So I think that that just goes to show you that, um, like in Virginia, they're starting to get more of a statewide approach, and it's an interprofessional program. Um, we're also uh, planning a governor signing event. I don't have much details about it yet. I'm waiting to hear back whether or not everything's been secured. But that's really exciting too, to have the governor and the commissioner of health for the state of New Jersey declare it and, and participate in it, um, you know, by signing their own and, and making a proclamation. Those are always successful events. Um, over the years, next slide, Patty. Um, I just wanted to share with you some examples of creative programming that we've done. Um, you know, book discussions, uh, we've had professional conferences for clergy, we did a mayor's advanced direct signing event, um, film screenings uh, with conversations afterward. We've participated in the conversation Sabbath out of the conversation project, had community discussions, and um, I just got some pictures to show you the kinds of events that we do. So the top right, I wanna show you, that's a board that we use with one of the task forces I'm on in the state um, called the Converse, Conversation of Your Life. It's a before I die board, it's an art installation and it's um, large and it gets put out there for people to write in. So, but that was an interesting one. Next slide, Patty. So I wanted to share with you, um, just so you could have this as a resource. The summit that I was talking about um, on April 18th, it, this is the title of it. This is the programming, this is our, our objectives, and then why reinvent the wheel? That's what I love about the Conversation Project too. I'm giving this to you and feel free to use it. It's not pro proprietary in any way. Use the ideas and take it forth. Um, next slide. This is our agenda. And I wanted to point out a couple of things on this. As early on after the opening remarks, um, we've invited a community member to share her story, and we're calling it a daughter story. Um, Adina Avery Grossman is a writer, and she, I've heard her speak. She, it's a, she does a beautiful job of portraying a compelling story and reason for why advanced care planning is important. And then, as you see, down later on, on the 8.05 to 8.35 time, I get the call to action. And I actually specifically asked to be um, placed here because I, I, like many people, get tired of being on that durable wheel. And what I want is not another conference where we're preaching to the choir, where the people come and they listen and then they go home. Um, I was inspired by, um, by things I've learned through the Conversation Project and I'm actually going to be um, entitling my talk, what can you do by next Tuesday? Uh, this is a common question asked at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which houses the Conversation Project. And I love the idea of after giving all this information out to the professionals in the community saying, so what can you do by Tuesday? Uh, taking them back to their own uh, you know, workplaces and no matter what the workplace is and finding something that they can do with regards to the healthcare decisions, say in advanced care planning. 
Um, next slide, Patty. So the lessons that I've learned through working with the Conversation Project, a couple of golden nuggets are to really think big, but start small. Um, it's a monumental task to try to influence a healthcare system or a community, um, especially one as diverse as what we have here in New Jersey. Um, and I've had to, I'm, I'm a, I, I like to be a visionary and I'm not the most patient person. I get frustrated easily, but I have learned through the conversation project how to approach things and to just be really happy with the successes that, that we've been able to grow through the years. Um, this past spring, uh, I was able to uh, help get permission to launch a pilot project here in the hospital on one of our acute care floors from May to September. We applied best practices using advanced care planning, our best practices in advanced care planning uh, to our workflow and processes on one of our floors. And recently I was able to present uh, our findings and my recommendations to the bioethics committee at the hospital. And then in, in early uh, February, February 5th, I actually got to meet with the medical director for the hospital and present it to him as well um, and make some recommendations. So a lot has grown out of just that day, those days back of having the table in the lobby. Um, we're trying to really affect a big change in our healthcare system. Next slide. And Tracy, just a little less than a minute. Okay, slide. So um, one year out of, out of Healthcare Decisions Day, we had a table set up in our coffee shop and I decided that it was a lot of work for one day and we instead we needed to have it ongoing. And so I just wanted to share with you this program that I started in May of 2016 and the number of conversations um, that we've been able to have just by setting up our little tent in the coffee shop. Um, so I just wanted to share that idea and feel free to replicate that too. It's casual. We meet people where they're at, where they're ready to. Some people fill out documents that day. Sometimes they come back the next month or months later um, it's really just about encouraging the conversation and normalizing it for people. Um, next slide, real quick. Uh, just wanted to say that I think the other key nugget is partnering. Um, I could not do anything that I've been doing without work with the committee inside the hospital that was developed a few years ago, my work with the Conversation Project, and also with a New Jersey organization called Conversation of Your Life. And the last slide is my contact information um, in case anybody wanted to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions after this call, you know, going forward. So feel free to send me, an email, okay? Are you there? Yes, uh -oh. thank you. Hi, sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I've been talking and didn't realize I was not on mute. Thank you so much. I know um, you all have done a tremendous amount. Um, this was a, a good task to try to keep it short. You did that um, and you gave us a really nice taste of some really good ideas um, that are um, thinking big but starting small, so I appreciate that. Um, you have been very good at uh, doing some really big actions and I love your action steps um, to really make this an actual step rather than just the conversation, what can we do next? So I think that's great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and if you all have any questions for Tracy, um, go ahead and pop that in the chat button and we're, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, so I am excited for um, another example. We've got Dr. Julianne Thomas who is representing the MedQuarter Regional Medical District, uh, which is work in Cedar Rapids, Ohio, uh, Iowa. Um, and I know there's some great uh, um, I, Iowan, Iowan, I'm not getting that right, but calling in from Iowa, so I'm excited to have uh, many, many on the call. So Julianne is a retired uh, private pediatric uh, practitioner, and she also is doing some volunteer, volunteer leadership positions uh, at the state and national level for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, when she was recruited by the Cedar Rapids mayor uh, to be on the new MedQuarters Commission, um, she served on that commission for about six years and chaired the marketing and branding committee. Um, and when the Faith and Medicine Task Force started two years ago, um, she continued to serve through planning some advanced care planning events. Um, and we are just really pleased that she is here to share her community's experience and lessons learned and initiatives. So um, go ahead, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, take it away. 
Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Can you confirm? Yes, we can. You're, you're perfect. Okay. Um, it's really a pleasure to share the Cedar Rapids experience in community engagement on end of life planning uh, spearheaded by the MedQuarter. I listened in on this um, phone call a year ago and it's really uh, given us a lot of um, uh, impetus to go forward with this project. Um, the MedQuarter is the only medical district that I have found in the United States that's a Schmid a self-sustaining municipal improvement district. It was established, as Patty said, in 2012, and our priorities are promoting our nationally recognized high-quality, low-cost medical care, amenities and points of interest in the med quarter, economic development, and community engagement. Uh, what you're seeing on this slide is um, the med quarter um, website and the banners that are rotating on it um, for these four priorities. And this one is the community engagement, um, end of life planning, the importance of conversation. And if you click on, if, if this were live and you clicked it on more information, you would go to our landing page that has a great deal of information about our end of life projects. Um, the, we established a Faith and Medicine Task Force uh, two years ago, and we decided that the community engagement uh, project we wanted was end-of-life planning. This is an aerial photo of a portion of the medical district. It is a 55-block area with 10th Street as the spine of the med quarter, and this is 10th Street. Uh, vertically. At the very top of the slide of the photo is the um, Mercy Hospital complex. At the base of the slide is the St. Luke's Unity Point Hospital complex. In the middle is a very large multi-specialty clinic with a um, walkway over to a parking ramp. And just above that is First Lutheran Church um, and Pastor Steve Knutson is the um, pastor of that church and the um, chair of our committee. Um, diagonally across from that is Immaculate Conception Catholic Church and Father Chris Podaski is also on our Faith and Medicine Task Force. In addition, we have five doctors. One is a palliative care hospice doctor. Three of us are retired. And there's one physician who manages our continuing medical education in Cedar Rapids. We have one lawyer, um, two pastor, uh, pastoral care representatives from each of the hospitals, uh, two um, leaders in honoring your choices from St. Luke's, the director of the Family Caregiver Center, a funeral director, and the executive director of the, of the med quarter. These are the people who chose to focus on end of life planning and put together um, a speak up series. And this is the top of one of our flyers um, that we had for last year's National Healthcare Decision Day um, event. Um, this one has our two um, hospice and palliative care physicians in Cedar Rapids, one representing each hospital and they gave the, the presentation in conjunction with National Healthcare Decisions Day. Prior to this, we had um, three uh, events in October, November, and December, the first Thursdays. We kicked off the events with B.J. Miller, who is a nationally known speaker on end-of-life planning. We also had, at that time, a leadership discussion with community leaders and B.J. Miller about what what kind of direction we were thinking about taking. He was very impressed about what we were doing from the community level and was anxious to see us move forward. Next in November, we had a, con or a discussion of medical and legal decisions with one of our physicians and also an Iowa attorney who has published a book on end-of-life planning. After that um, event, we had a workshop um, it was really well attended. Um, so we, um, at this April 2018 conference, we did have, again, another workshop. 
In December, we had a workshop uh, or a discussion on spiritual perspectives with a panel of Jewish, Muslim, Protestant, Catholic, and humanist speakers. Unfortunately, this was the least attended because of all of the holiday season, but it was so good. The only thing that I regret is that we didn't tape it because it was really excellent. Again, because of great interest, we planned the Encore event um, in conjunction with the National Healthcare Decision Day on April 16th, 2018. Um, this is the inside of the church um, that we um, utilized for these events. Um, each of the events um, had anywhere from 120 to over 270 participants. The one for National Healthcare Decision Day last year was 160, there were 160 people at the event. Um, the event was primarily attended by older people. One third were in the 50 to 65 year old age group and two thirds were over 65 years of age. And there were about 10 people that were younger. Um, the workshops were held in the church um, basement, and they um, we had 18 honoring your choices facilitators and 12 lawyers who helped families discuss end of life planning, advanced directives, and some even left with it, their advanced directives already completed. So we felt it was really successful. We did find um, in our reviews of um, the participants that if you were under 50, um, it was very unlikely that you had an advanced directive completed. For those that were 50 to 65, 34% <coughs> excuse me, had um, their advanced directive. And if you were over 65, 79% of our attendees had advanced directives. So that was encouraging, at least for the older population. Um, we used a lot of resources um, in putting together um, these events. When I did the research, um, I found that the conversation project was very, very useful. And we used um, the conversation starter kit for the two workshops. We also, at the second workshop, used the how to be a proxy. Um, on our website, we have the faith linkage to the faith video um, that the Conversation Project has available. We also found advancedcareplanning.ca very useful. That's the Canadian um, project, um, and we use Speak Up with their permission um, because we liked that. We also use their videos, uh, which we put onto the walls of the church as people were um, getting seated because they did not require any audio. Um, we also use the NHDD website, particularly the partic participation forms, and also how to plan um, events. And all of that on the website was very useful. Um, what we learned um, from uh, this is that newspapers were the best way to reach an audience because it was mostly older. Um, we needed materials in hard copy because some of the people didn't have access to internet. And they found it confusing to have multiple advanced care planning um, forms. So we came down to just two, the Iowa Bar Association form and honoring your wishes. Uh, we also found that phone numbers were really useful uh, for local resources. So this is a, a community um, down uh, project. We found that um, the, the challenges where we had trouble reaching minorities and young adults, and so we need a different way to reach them. Uh, we also had low physician participation, despite the fact that we provided uh, CME credit. So um, we are now going forward to um, develop a leadership engagement project to tra change the system so that everyone in um, Cedar Rapids medical facilities are, dis they have discussions about advanced directives and um, that those directives are retrievable and are honored. 
Um, so that's what we're doing. This is the uh, website to um, see all of the information that we have and um, my email and also the email of our executive director of the med quarter, Phil Wasta. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, this has been a great mix of examples of how to bring multicultural perspectives uh, to the table, um, how to really have action um, at the events and having different uh, areas of expertise be available there. So really appreciate you sharing your example. Um, if anyone has questions for Julie or, um, or for Tracy, go ahead and pop that into the chat button. We may not be able to get to everything just given time. Um, on the call, but we definitely will follow up post-call and make sure that all questions are being answered. Um, so thank you so much, Julie. And I'm going to go ahead, um, if you can take that ball and drag it up to my name, um, I'm going to introduce our third speaker. Um, we have, um, we've gone from, um, from a, a one hospital system to a, a regional me medical district, and now we're going to a statewide initiative. And so I'm pleased to introduce Phil Martin who's going to share the Advanced Directives Tennessee initiative with us. Um, Phil is um, the Contract Executive Director for Honoring Choices Tennessee, which began about four years ago with 16 member organizations. So a lot of different groups coming together for the stated purpose of encouraging Tennesseans to discuss healthcare decisions, um, to document those choices and really enjoy, and I love this, greater peace of mind and quality of life as a result. Um, so Phil, I want to go ahead and pass this to you for the last uh, remaining 10 minutes. Do we have Phil? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Are you with me? Can you hear me now? I can. That's perfect. Go oh. ahead. Hello. Okay. Um, well, that's great. And I'll tell you something. The great thing about this call and the great thing about the people all over the country that are doing this work is that there's no borrowed idea. It's, it's all fair game. And I've noticed that Tracy and her group have used bucket list in uh, New Jersey. We've used that here with great success. We also uh, use the um, uh, conversation project and uh, NHDD resources all year long. We've, um, we've used their uh, materials, uh, specifically there are a couple of fact sheets that we use uh, verbatim, and then we, we have taken the, uh, the, the faith uh, kit that, the faith conversation kit that, um, that, that you have, and we've adapted it for Tennessee. And so we're, we're enjoying the fruits of everybody else's labor, and I hope, I hope the people on the call will do the same this year. We, again, as we started uh, four years ago, we, um, we started, let's see, um, I'm not able to advance the slide. So can somebody uh, take me to the next slide? Ah. We started in 2015, and the first thing we did was we said, let's, let's get out there, let's talk to uh, the general public, and let's, let's make sure we get our message right from the beginning. And so we did a lot of planning and research in those first two years. We launched a website in 2016, and uh, I'm going to give you the, um, uh, the site uh, URL in just a minute. But uh, we affiliated with Honoring Choices, the Honoring Choices movement in 2017. And in 2018, the things I'm going to talk about from uh, NHDD last year uh, were really focused primarily uh, on the healthcare workforce. Uh, this year, in 2019, we've, we've said we want to focus on the workplace and the faith place. And uh, so we are in the process of moving the ball down the field. We use National Healthcare Decisions Day as our milestone. Um, we, 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 this is a year-round uh, effort, but we, we measure ourselves every uh, April 16th, and, and we hope to have made incremental progress each year. We, we don't have we're like most of you, we don't have a big budget, we don't have a lot of resources, so, but this is a, uh, uh, an effort that comes from the heart. Uh, Patty mentioned that I'm a contract director, but I also have my own uh, advanced directives story, 
and and so I'm very passionate about this work. Uh, our ongoing challenges are resourcing and me measurement, and so if any of you have any ideas about that, we'd love to borrow those from you. Next slide, please. Phil, you can go ahead and change it. I, I moved your control over. Ah. All right. <clears throat> Easier said than done. Uh, I've got my arrow right underneath it. it. Yeah, okay, so, um, click, click yeah, I'm not able to, uh, I'm not okay. able to do that from here. Uh, okay, if you want to, um, Naomi, can I get the ball back? Or Phil, are you able to, um, ah, I got it. There we go, go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Okay, so that's our website. Uh, just wanted you to be able to, to go directly to the website, that's www.advancedirectivestn.org. Uh, next slide, please. We, we went from, from uh, that, we created some materials, and all of these were, came, grew out of the focus groups that we did across the state because we, we uh, segmented uh, our focus groups into what we call uh, the grays, and those are the people uh, over 65, uh, the people under 30 who we call uh, invincibles, and the people in the workforce uh, right in the middle. And one of the things that, that all of the focus groups said was, this is way too complicated uh, for me, and I don't like to deal with multi-page forms, and at that time our state had a multi-page form we were able to get it down to a fold-up form. You see that right in the middle, that's the front and the back of our fold-up form. And if you were holding one of these, you'd be able to unfold it into an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, two sides, and you'd be able to create your own advanced directive. And in Tennessee, we were able to do it without a notary, notary public, uh, as long as uh, we have two signatures from uh, independent um, objective uh, individuals. So uh, we've encouraged individuals to fill out the form, give their doctor uh, a copy of the form, g give their next of kin a copy of the form, and fold up the uh, piece of paper and put it in their wallet. So uh, it's, it's really, uh, that was a major stride forward when it comes to ease of use and, um, and uh, encouraging a lot of people who wouldn't even listen to the conversation before, once we made it really easy, they were able to uh, grasp that idea. And we just walk people through our fold-up form and, uh, and they have an advanced directive of their own. Next slide, please. And Phil, we're just about two minutes, and we gotta we gotta wrap it up. I apologize, but two more minutes. Got it, got it. Well, last year you can see some of the things we did. You can go ahead and let's just scroll scroll through um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, which was one of our uh, members, uh, sent information to all 5,000 of their employees through their company newsletter. Erlanger Health System had a private partnership with CVS. Uh, at a number of pharmacies, and we did retail distribution uh, of a brochure in those pharmacies. Uh, there was a there was a conference that began to emerge last year called the Book of Life Conference, and I'll share a little bit about that in a minute. But uh, last year was its inaugural year. Uh, Q, Q Source, our QIO for Medicare. Uh, shared it with their 11 transitions of care communities. And again, all of these things are the benefits of, of, of aligning with different organizations that would have an interest uh, in, in the subject. And once we got everybody to the table and were able to communicate with them, everybody started rowing in the same direction. Uh, we did a statewide news release. Next slide, please. And Phil, I'm going to change the slide. Phil, I'm going to just interrupt for a second. I apologize. Um, if people have to yeah. jump off at four, we can go ahead and let them jump off. You've got some really interesting um, ideas here, so I want to help have you keep going. Um, but right. you just recognize that we might have some people jumping off, and if that's the case, the recording is going to be available for everybody. But go ahead. All right. And next slide. Okay. And the medical association published it to all their doctors 
uh, across the state. The hospital association uh, pitched stories to local major daily newspapers. The governor uh, of Tennessee proclaimed uh, April 16th Healthcare Decisions Day in Tennessee. Uh, to our Medicaid waiver program shared information with uh, all 1,000 state employees uh, of Medic of TennCare, and uh, the eight uh, MCOs, managed care organizations, to train their own employees. Vanderbilt Medical Center has been a an enormous leader uh, in this in a lot of ways, and they, they've done a lot, of, a lot of things on campus, and you can see there are a couple of things they did this year. Uh, in the, in the year, in, in, the, in the next uh, National Healthcare Decisions Day coming up uh, April 16th, if you'll flip the slide uh, for me, you can see that we, we've already got the, uh, we have a new governor in Tennessee. We've already made the case to him and he's on board. Uh, so we've got, he's gonna, he's gonna come back and do his own proclamation this year uh, the um, uh, new Commissioner of Health is, is doing a video as we speak that we'll have up on our website. The Chattanooga Clergy Conference is going to be bigger and better. It's going to be on April 2nd. We did that because we are training uh, clergy to take it back to their own congregations and, and do these things. So we wanted to be a little bit ahead of um, of uh, April 16th, and um, a gentleman by the name of Greg Phelps down there is leading the charge on this. This was all his idea. He's a palliative care doctor uh, in Chattanooga. Uh, we're doing uh, a lunch and learn with the uh, Nashville YMCA, a very big location here. The University of Tennessee Health Science Center down in Memphis is doing an event. Uh, we've got uh, a uh, presentation to the Middle Tennessee Employee Benefits Coalition. These are the people who are, who are the gatekeepers for employee benefits across the state. And what we're finding is if we're able to, to, um, to educate them, they see this as value add for their clients. So um, they're, we're encouraged. We're developing an op-ed piece to run across the state uh, during um, uh, that week of, uh, of April the 15th, and uh, we have social media outreach among all our uh, member organizations uh, as we had last year. So that those that's where we really bulk up the numbers and get the buzz across the state. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. One thing that I want to, um, to, to mention specifically is this Book of Life conference uh, is open to the public. There is a modest, uh, individual registration fee of $35, which includes parking and lunch. So, um, but if if you happen to be in the Chattanooga area or, or are within driving distance of Chattanooga, I would highly recommend this. It's being held again on Tuesday, April 2nd at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga um, uh, conference or um, uh, conference center and um, and so uh, you can you can actually come and be a part of that conference and take away a lot of good ideas and so anyway that's that's my part of the presentation but I I couldn't um, echo more uh, a couple of the thoughts that came before me one was Nathan's comment that this is year-round this is and there are year-round resources from the conversation project and Tracy's comment that think big, but start small, because that's what we've done and that's what we will continue to do. Wonderful, Phil, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to those that are sticking around and, and um, sticking with the call. You have a tremendous amount of just ideas. Um, I love the lessons on make it less complicated. How do we make this more accessible to folks? Um, I also love the just variety of who you've involved um, across the state, um, YMCA and other partners, and, and everyone has their own um, piece of the pie that they can actually help um, and reach out and, and, and reach their different particular community members. So I really appreciate you sharing this. Um, I just want to give a shout out to all three, Phil, um, Julie, and, and Tracy. Thank you so much for sharing your examples with us. Um, I'm going to wrap uh, up things up and go through a few more slides if you want to stick with us. I'll uh, make it really quick. 
We will definitely have um, the slides and the recording as well as the chat available after this call. Um, so everybody will have the contact information for further information. You can contact these great speakers. Um, Nathan, anything you want to say um, before we before I run through the, the remaining slides? Uh, other than just thanks, everybody. I mean, the the comments, everything that's been in the resources. Hopefully, this is all available to the participants for later. Um, but this is great. I, I just am so thrilled by the examples that we've. Uh, heard talked about today. Those are just the tip of the iceberg, but they're great um, inspiration for others to do just wonderful things. So go out there and get them. Great, thank you. And just uh, just some last minute wrap up so you can join us on some other things. Um, we have some upcoming conversation project community calls. So we have this the third Wednesday of every month. Um, we would encourage you to join us uh, for any of these calls. They are for open for anybody. Um, our next one is on Wednesday, March, March 20th, and that's a speaker's training, which will basically uh, like a workshop of the conversation starter kit. So we walk people through a slide deck that we have available for you um, and teach you lessons that we've heard from uh, other communities about running a workshop around the conversation starter kit. Um, we've got uh, coming up, so our next, what we'd love to say is our next national holiday is Conversation Sabbath. We can't quite say that yet. Um, but we do have a wonderful opportunity to um, encourage congregations around the country to preach and teach about the importance of conversations, and that is coming up in October. Um, it runs across two weekends and during the week to uh, ensure we're hitting um, different holy holidays for various um, uh, different religions. And so we can get more information on our website about that. Um, this is a, a local um, example. We heard about um, uh, some great multicultural experiences that Julie was doing, um, as well as uh, in Tennessee um, and Tracy. Here's one in Massachusetts. Um, you can take a look at the slides. It's very hard to see. I know it's tiny, um, but it's another example of an NHDB event um, that is being sponsored um, by the Boston Theological Institute on April 2nd. Um, the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness uh, is having this as part of their NHDB activity. Uh, and it's helping to gear up uh, communities to get ready for Conversation Sabbath. So it combines a couple of different events. Um, so there's, uh, again, there's a lot of ways to, um, to share uh, and, and basically um, have NHDB go all year round as, as Nathan and our presenters have shared. Um, we have a new resource at TCP. It's a phenomenal uh, story from Bethel AME Church about how they brought conversations um, to their congregation and their community about what matters most in life, death, and dying. Um, that can be found on our website, too. It's a, a, really, a really great story about the work that they've done over the last few years. Um, and then as you all exit today, um, it's really important if you have another couple minutes, I know I'm taking up your time, give us some feedback on this call and let us know what your plans are for NHDB. 2019. Um, we get content from you all to share across our platforms. We'd love to share what you're doing and what your plans are, um, and perhaps you can be a part of this call next year. So I encourage you to take, just to take a few minutes on that survey. Um, thank you, everybody. There's been a phenomenal um, bit of sharing over chat and different examples. Um, I love all the examples that are being shared on chat. We will make sure that we have this for you. Um, and I just want to thank, again, all the speakers and um, our participants here today. And with that, I will close out our call and thank you for joining us. I'm going to stick on the call just for another minute or two in case there's any other questions for me I can answer, but thank you all. This is Nathan just chiming in saying thank you so much. This is great. And I'm going to sign off, Patty. This is Tracy. Thank you to you as well and to my friends at TCP and HDD. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you both. And same from here from Julie. Thank you again. Thank you, Julie.